15 years now. Uh, I became a Christian in 1997. And uh, one thing I've become convinced of in my walk with Jesus over the years is that Jesus wants to upset the mode in our lives. He wants to upset the mode uh, in our lives and in our thinking because he's a transformational God. And let's face it, when we come to Jesus, we're in a bit of a mess, aren't we? And we do need transformation. We do need change. We do need a mode change in our lives. And um, when, we, when we see Jesus in the scripture, it, you know, half the time he's causing trouble, isn't he? He doesn't mean to be causing trouble, but you see, people are so stuck in their ways and so blinkered and so religious that when he, he, he comes into contact with religious people, he upsets them. He upsets the mode. Uh, so he's constantly upsetting people, whether it's uh, turning over tables in the temple, or whether it's um, whether it's uh, mixing with prostitutes, or whatever it is, Jesus is upsetting the mode. And um, uh, I was thinking about that word mode, so I looked it up in the dictionary. And uh, mode is defined as a way or manner in which something occurs or is experienced, expressed or done. Let me read that again. Mode, a, a way or manner in which something occurs or is expressed or experienced or done. And uh, I was thinking about Jesus, yeah? And um, <laughs> Jesus came to show a new way to a people who were tired. I believe that the people of Jesus' generation and, and Jesus' time, first century Israel, were tired people. They were tired out. They were worn out with religion. They were worn out with the, the, the standards being imposed on them by the Roman Empire. Of course, we know Jerusalem was under Roman occupation. They were tired people. They were worn out. The, these people had been looking to religious leaders uh, 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 throughout, throughout the, the, the centuries preceding. They'd seen many failures in the kings that had represented them to the point where they no longer had a kingdom in place anymore. The, the nation was in complete disarray. And, um, and uh, uh, so these people were tired, they were, they were without direction, they were without a leader. And uh, seven times, I love the book of John because uh, it's, it's such a great book, but seven times in the book of John, um, John declares things about the character and person of Jesus Christ that are game changers. They are mode changers, these declarations that, that, uh, that John makes. Seven times, uh, Jesus um, upsets the mode by declaring certain things about himself. You know, Jesus often declared things about himself, didn't he? And of course, when he did, people were like, well, I'm not so sure about that, Jesus. You're just like one of us. You're, you know, you're human. But Jesus comes on the scene in John 6.35. He says, I'm the bread of life. And you've got to eat from me, yeah? I'm, I'm the bread, I'm the sustenance that you need. He comes along, he says, in, in John chapter 8, 12, I'm the light of the world. Whoever looks to me will never have darkness, will never walk in darkness, all this kind of stuff. He says, I'm the gate to come through, yeah? I'm the gate to come through. If you come through me, you're going to be in a safe place, yeah? If you come through me, you're going to have access to an eternal state. To, to eternity with, with everything recreated and everything made right. Jesus says that I am the good shepherd in John 10, 11. You know, there have been lots of bad shepherds in, 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 in the generations preceding Jesus. Um, Ezekiel talks about the, the false shepherds in Israel, how they were just looking after themselves, feeding themselves. They weren't concerned about the sheep. The, the, the sheep or the people of the nation were just in, in disarray. They had no leaders. And, and you have these people, the so-called religious leaders, trying to um, um, uh, uh, be religious, but not actually giving people life. And, and Jesus comes along, he says, look, I'm the one, I'm, I'm the good shepherd, I'm the one that's promised, that this good shepherd was promised to the people, he says, I am the good shepherd. They were all waiting for the good shepherd, because the nation was in disarray. Uh, Jesus comes along, he says, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. I love that verse, it's one of my favourite verses in the Bible. You know, Jesus being like the way for me, and the truth for me, and the life for me. I, I want Jesus' life, I want the truth of Jesus in my life. I want to go his way. He says, I am the true vine in John 15, 1. Yeah? So, so basically, we know that a, a vine or a vine plant supports 
And anything, anything within that vine, any branches within that vine, get their life from the vine. In another place, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. We're the branches <coughs> that are crafted into the vine. But he is the true vine. And of course, the nation of Israel was often defined as a vine. And, and of course, the, the kings in charge of the nation were, 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 were the ones that were supposed to keep this vine alive. The, the prophets and teachers were supposed to be the ones that kept the vine alive. But they didn't keep the vine alive. Because they didn't have a real relationship with God, a vibrant relationship with God. And then finally, in John chapter, um, in, in John, in, in the book of John, he says, "I am the resurrection, and I am the life to you." And I tell you something: I need resurrection in my life. Yeah, I need, I need, I need resurrection. I need to be lifted up again and again from from places and from situations, and just from the humdrum of daily life and the pressures of life. I need resurrection, friends. And Jesus is my resurrection. It's your resurrection this morning. So these, he comes on, Jesus bursts on the scene, he declares these incredible things about himself. He, 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 he upsets the mode. Because all these people thought that they were shepherds. All these people thought that they were the vine that was supporting the people. All these people that were in charge of the nation thought that they were giving life to the people. And Jesus comes along and says, it's all a sham actually. I am these things. I am these things. So this radical Jesus bursts on the scene. And it's interesting because prior to these statements of Jesus, the people had had to come through to God through the temple system and the priests and all the mechanics of religion. And, and uh, Jesus bursts out on the scene and declares emphatically that he... is going to upset the moon. <laughs> he's going to upset the mode. <laughs> and virtually at the, uh, at, at the start of Jesus' public ministry, one man, a leader, who was part of this system, part of the Jewish council, the temple system, sees this extraordinary Jesus doing extraordinary things, this unconventional Jesus doing unconventional things, and he wants to know about this radical change of mode that is taking place in the nation. If you've got a Bible, let's uh, turn to John chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 16. <coughs> okay. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus said. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. I like to think that Jesus was being a bit sarcastic, uh, Nicodemus was being a bit sarcastic when he said that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, I think he was, yeah. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still <coughs> you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as, as Moses was lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have 
you turn the light. Do you know, it's that funny, right? Because my passage finishes there this morning, but Heather brought me um, a little plaque there. You can just see it on the side. It says, John 3.16, <laughs> which is, the next, of course, the next verse, isn't it? And what does it say on the plaque? I love you more. I love you more, yeah? So, so maybe God's got a little bit more. Maybe, maybe we should put it on 3.16 next week. But we'll, we'll see We'll see how, how God leads us. But I just thought it was great that Heather brought that in, and my, my passage finishes at John 3.15. Anyway, okay. The first, uh, within the first three verses of this passage, we come across this great man called Nicodemus. I love Nicodemus. What a great guy. Apart from having one of the coolest names in the Bible, this is a great guy. He's a great guy. And uh, he's an influential guy. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish uh, high court in Israel. He's a rabbi, like Jesus. He's a teacher. He teaches the Bible, basically, the Old Testament, which is all he had in those days. He's a teacher. He's a great guy. And um, he's very, very highly thought of uh, within the nation. He's probably one of the leading, leading teachers of the time. And um, as he was a teacher like Jesus, because Jesus was saying such extraordinary things, and it was all corroborated and backed up by the Word of God, he, he wants to come and hear some more. And, and, and we hear from the scriptures, uh, from the verses, uh, verses 1 and 2, that, that uh, this Nicodemus had actually seen Jesus perform actual miracles. He, he'd seen Jesus doing some crazy stuff, healing people and all this kind of stuff. And this guy called Nicodemus was absolutely blown away, astounded by this Jesus. And in verses 1 and 2, Nicodemus comes to pay Jesus a visit. And it's interesting because he comes at a time when everything's calmed down, when all the people have got away from the big meetings in the day to have their tea. He comes at a time when uh, he can't be seen by any of his colleagues because we're told that he comes at night time uh, in verse 2. And this Nicodemus comes to Jesus in incognito mode. He comes to Jesus in incognito mode. He comes at a time when he can best conceal his identi identity. And for me, in a lot of respects, he reminds me of the church on this island. He reminds me of the church on this island. I believe, in a lot of respects, the church on this island is incognito. It's incognito. Yeah? I, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but like from what I see, I've been here 19 months, from what I can see, the church is a little bit incognito, yeah? So he comes to, comes to, comes to Jesus, yeah? Identity concealed, and um, he comes wanting to know more. And, and I believe there are people out, outside of the church, like Nicodemus, they want to come and know more, yeah? They want to come and check it out, but we've become so irrelevant in the way we promote church and do church and everything else that, that people, people are confused. They don't really know what we're about because everything's been hidden for too long. And I believe for, for many decades, and I might be wrong, so you can correct me afterwards, but I do believe for many de decades, the, ch the churches on this island have got to have been a little bit incognito. Because why would they be in such, such a state of decline if that wasn't the case? Why would they be in such a state of decline? And I believe that Jesus wants a public church. He wants a church that is a lampstand. He wants a church and a people that are not going to conceal their identity as Nicodemus did. And as a follower of Jesus, I refuse to live in incognito mode. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I refuse to live a life where I'm embarrassed about the church I go to, the people I belong to, the, uh, uh, the part that I play in, in, in the community of Hollyhead. I refuse to be incognito. And that's why our church is so in your face. Because I tell you, we've got, to, we've got to get that message out there. We've got to be telling our, our town that the church is alive. It's very much alive. And, and that God very much wants people to come into the church, experience church, learn about Jesus, and find a true and living relationship with him. And I believe that over the last 19 months, God has been challenging us 
as a church, to come out of that state of being incognito. Of being incognito. And as we've been having a go at that, and we've been pushing out, we've been trying to share, share with people what's going on, as we've been um, showing people uh, testimonies of people and inviting them to different things, and as we've been promoting our cafe church, I believe that God is blessing our church because we're choosing to be outward looking, outward focused. We're choosing to actually say, well, there is an answer to people's difficult situations and lives, and it is Jesus Christ. Yeah? As we've begun to minister to the people of our town in practical and spiritual way, ways, I believe there's been an awakening in each of us as the people of God in this church. I believe there's an awakening taking place. And of course, it's not, um, it's not kind of uh, manifested itself in massive numbers coming in, but I tell you, we're awake, aren't we? We do realise that actually we're not here to just meet and study God's Word and then go out and not tell anyone or not have anything to do with anyone's life. We're here as witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus, yeah? We're here as witnesses to show that he is alive. I want to I want to live a life where God's alive in me. So much so that people see that he's alive in me. I want each one of us in here to be so alive in Jesus where wherever we go, where wherever we place our feet, we gain ground in Jesus Christ. We 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 demonstrate to our town and to our neighbours and to everyone we come into contact with that 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 being a Christian makes you an amazing person. It makes you someone who's happy. It makes you someone who's full of joy. It makes you someone who is positive. It makes you someone who is um, thinking in a different way to the way this world thinks. You know, so often in the church, what's happened is the, the values, the modes of society have been placed on the church. And, and we think the way the world thinks. But God doesn't want us to think that way. He wants us to think in a different way. He wants us to think outward. Outward. And I want to make a challenge to each one of us in here this morning. Are we like, are we like Nicodemus? Are we like Nicodemus? Are our lives hidden? Myself as well. A part, this part of my life hidden. Yeah? So people can't see the true reality of Jesus in my life. Is there a bit of Nicodemus spirit in me? Am I a little incognito when certain things happen and, you know, I'm a little bit embarrassed about being a Christian. I'm, I'm asking a question and um, I'm hoping that I'm not like that. I'm hoping I'm the real deal, yeah? But, but that's a good question to ask ourselves, isn't it? Because I believe what God is looking for in his church is for us to come out of the shadows. And start in confidence in who we are again. To start being a people who are very public about who we are in Jesus Christ and about what we believe. I really believe that. When I go into the school and do uh, an assembly tomorrow, I want to be just very public about what I believe in Jesus. Yeah? And uh, they kick me out. They kick me out. But every kid in there will know that I love Jesus. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And that's why I want the town to know that this, this Jesus we can fall in love with, that he's the answer to our lives, that he's, he's incredible in every way, and he helps us, and, and it's a real relationship, it's day to day, he's in our lives, he's in our situations, he's overlooking everything that we do, he's disciplining us sometimes, he's dealing with all kinds of issues in our lives. I want people to know that this Jesus that we, we, we live for, and we talk about, and we come to worship in this place, is is, is very much alive in this town and in, in the people of God here. And I see the life of God in you, and I want to say it's just such an encouragement. Some of the things that people have brought to me and, and, and materialised as a result of, you know, God speaking to our hearts and us being obedient and saying, well, actually, we'll have a go. We'll have a go. Yeah. I was just thinking about that whole public thing and, um, you know, the, when we did our community fun week, it was very chaotic, yeah? It wasn't great, yeah? <coughs> but I tell you, it was brilliant. It was brilliant because we met so many people during that week. So many people knew that when the churches had put, put the thing on, there were, there, were, there were hundreds of people came through the doors of the Boston Centre stage that week. And, and I believe we saw some of them in video after this week, which was a real lesson to the team, I believe. Um, but you know, that's what it's all about, isn't it? 
These people need the Lord. They need the Lord. And because we've gone out, because we've ploughed and we've sown, and we've told people about what we do, people have come in. People have come in. And I, I want to tell you that. Um, just go over this last few weeks, we've been following up on some of those people who made responses to the gospel. And uh, we've been trying to help them uh, find a home here at Thomas Street. We've been making uh, some great connections. <coughs> I've been working with a couple of people on this. Great connections behind the scene to help people come to a place where they, too, can change their mode. And that's just what we see in this passage. We see Nicodemus being radically changed and changing the mode of his life, the direction of his life. Jesus says to this guy in verse 3, <coughs> Look, it's good that you've come and it's good that you search me out tonight. It's good that you're sincere and you want to understand things I've been saying, because we're both rabbis and we can talk about this stuff, we understand it. But you know, Nicodemus, tonight I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you what you need. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you need to change mode. You need to change mode. Listen to what Jesus says in verse 3. Jesus says, these amazing words. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Unless he's born again. He says the same thing in verse 7. Verse 7 says, You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. You must be born again. Many of us in here this morning have experienced this second birth experience that Jesus talks about. We, we, someone told us that Jesus died on the cross for us publicly. We believe that. If he did that. It was a historical thing. Someone told, told us that we needed to say sorry for everything that we've done in our lives. We came and we repented. We said sorry. And repentance means we turned direction and went the other way. We stopped going God's way instead of going our way. And we meant it with our hearts, and God, for each of us individually, did something transformational within our situations. He made us come alive. We were born again. That was our experience, wasn't it? We experienced a spiritual awakening. We, we, we understood what it feels like to be truly forgiven, what it feels like to be truly loved, what it feels like to be truly accepted by God as he came into our lives in a real and a supernatural way. That's what happened for me. That's what happened for me. It's a real thing. And I tell you, once, once that thing had happened, there was no turning back. As that old hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Yeah, and I tell you, that, that was what it was for me. <laughs> That's what it was for you in your situations. And some of us, for whatever reason, at some point, we went off, off beam and, and things went wrong. We did, we did turn away, but God has always been... Uh, loving us and having his hand upon us and bringing us back into that place where we can once again have a, re a restored relationship with him. It's called being born again, friends. <laughs> and God wants to give us a second birth. And that's, that's what he's saying to Nicodemus. You need to have a second birth. And Nicodemus has a lot of questions to ask Jesus. A lot of things that he wants to understand about this supernatural rebirthing of life. So he says these things to Jesus, and fair cop, yeah, to Nicodemus, he's asking some good stuff here, yeah, he's asking some really good stuff, he's an intelligent man, very intelligent man, he asks these questions, he says, how can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asks, surely he can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, I'm going to read verse 5, John. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. And that's a great word, because what Jesus is essentially saying is that, Nicodemus, if you change mode, if you change direction, if you believe in me and give your life to me, your life is going to be washed clean. Your life is going to be completely washed clean 
in a supernatural way. And I tell you, do you remember how it felt when you gave your life to Jesus and, and literally you felt like you'd been washed clean? I tell you, I felt like I'd been washed clean. It was unbelievable. I, you know, I, I tried to ask God into my life to forgive me and all this kind of stuff. I tried to follow the procedure, and I tell you, I, I, I was never fully there, never really wanted it. And, and, and there was one, one time I really wanted it, yeah? I really knew that this was for me. And I asked him in, I tell you, I, I was washed clean. It was unbelievable. I just felt completely clean and full of joy and, and full of God and, and alive and something that changed. Yeah? It was a real thing. And that's what's kept me going all these years. And what keeps me going. And what, what compels me to want other people to have the same experience I've had. Shouldn't that, that be the compelling thing that God forgave us? That my filthy life, God forgave it. Your filthy lives, God forgave you. Your filthy lives and washed you clean in a supernatural way. He's saying, look, Nicodemus, the Spirit of God is going to come into your life and you're going to see things from God's perspective. You're going to know God in a real and a spiritual way. It's not just going to be a thing of duty like it's always been or an honourable thing like it's always been. It's not just going to be a religious transaction. <coughs> you're going to feel different because the Spirit of God is going to come and live in you. It's going to come into your heart and dwell there in power. And that's how it was for us, friends. At one time, we didn't know God, and now we know Him. And the power of God's Holy Spirit lives within each one of us. And we know this love because it pounds within us. You know, the best times in my relationship with God is when I'm closest to Him. And the love of God is pounding in my heart. When it's real, yeah? And for each one of us in here, that's our experience. And that is great stuff, isn't it? Because yeah. that's something the world can't offer. We're alive now in a new way. And the challenge for each one of us in here this morning is to <coughs> keep changing mode. We've got to keep changing. One of the best bits of advice my uh, pastor, I got saved under, said to me was, whatever you do, Dave, keep moving. Keep moving. Yeah? Because when we come to Jesus, everything we are, everything we do, has to keep changing mode. And I just love this passage because Jesus says in verse 6 that the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. And I think there's something quite prophetic over our lives with that verse, you know. The Spirit within us is constantly rebirthing itself, giving birth to Spirit, giving birth to Spirit, renewing us, renewing us, renewing us, challenging us, compelling us, pushing us, urging us, driving us along in love. The, the Spirit is rebirthing itself all the time. And, and, and we have a choice <laughs> of whether to move in the flow of the rebirth of the Spirit of God within our lives or whether to stay stuck in our ways, doing the things the same way we've always done them, playing the game of religion. And I want to tell you, this town needs the real deal. The game of religion will not work for this town. There are religious people in the churches all across the town. There are born-again people all across the town. Yeah? But I believe the church is crippled when sp spirit no longer gives birth to spirit. And Jesus is saying, look, when this thing happens, this real life change in you, spirit will give birth to, this, to the spirit. And we have to choose to live in the power of God's spirit at work in our lives. We have to choose to be transformed into who and what God wants us to be. And I want to tell you that that can be a painful thing. That can be a thing that requires incredible sacrifice. That can be a thing that is just will just knock us down from time to time because the weight and the pressure of what God wants to bring to bear on, on us to, to put to death some things in our lives has to happen so that spirit can come alive and give birth to spirit. 
And I believe God would say to each one of us in here this morning, where are you in the things of the Spirit of God? Where are you? God would whisper to each one of us this morning, I am here and I want to help you to change moments. Oh, God loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay the same. That's an old cliche, isn't it? What's, there's a cliche, isn't there? Does, any, does anyone know that cliche? It's like, God loves us, that he never keep us the same or something like that. And it's so true. It's so true. You know, the thing I love about the character of Nicodemus is that he moves in his life from a place of incognito mode to a, chain, a place where he is in changing mode and then he moves again to another place where he is in comprende mode. Comprende mode. Yeah, I like that, do you? Comprende. You say yes. Yes to the things of the Spirit. Yes to everything that God has for my life. Comprende. Yeah? Comprende mode. And I want to live my life in comprende mode. Yeah? Uh, John, John 7.50 says that when Jesus was arrested and taken to court, seven chapters later, yeah? It was Nicodemus who was the only one who stood up and defended Jesus publicly, saying, does our Lord judge a man first without giving him a hearing and learning what he has to say? It was Nicodemus who was there when Jesus was arrested. The only one to defend him, because he was saying yes to the things of the Spirit. He could have kept quiet, you know, friends. But he was part of the Jewish court, the religious system. He could have kept quiet. He could have kept stunned. But he was in comprende mode. Yes to the things of the Spirit. Yes, I'm going to stand up for this Jesus Christ. It was Nicodemus who helped Joseph of Arimathea take Jesus' body down from the cross. That's significant, friends. It was him who helped Joseph take the body and lay it in the tomb at great risk to his own safety and his own reputation. I think that's incredible that, that you know, in John it begins with Nicodemus. Um, and, and I don't know if it's in this gospel, but certainly in some of the other gospels it finishes with Nicodemus. I think that's incredible, friends, because he's been right on the scene, right along the journey with Jesus, yeah? It's wonderful. It's great. It's Nicodemus who donates £75 of expensive myrrh and alloys. 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 They're on cars, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Donates this expensive myrrh and aloes, which was the stuff used for anointing bodies for burial in, in the first century. It gives it, gives it so that Jesus can have a decent burial. I think that's just fantastic. Nic Nicodemus <laughs> comes to a place where he understands that Jesus truly is the Son of God. <coughs> what a great guy. I'm going to hang out with Nicodemus in heaven and I'm going to be just. I don't know what, we're going to be drinking some there uh, and uh, sharing a few about hello. Yeah, I don't know if you stuff you can eat and drink. But anyway, you know, I, you know, I, I want to talk to Freya and say what was going on, you know. And when did it happen for you? And, and how did God come into your life? And, 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 and you must have just been just so full of fear when you stood up in front of that, that Sanhedrin and said, you, you know, this guy deserves a fair trial. And you must have been so much, so much in fear when you're taking Jesus' body down from... From the, from the cross, when you're pulling the, the nails out with his hands. He comes to a place where he understands that Jesus is the Son of God. He comes to a place where he publicly <coughs> decides to be in comprende mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Comprende. Does everyone comprehend that this morning? <laughs> this great song I want to finish with this morning is some words from a song. It says, hear your people saying yes. Hear your people saying yes to you. Yes to anything you ask. Yes to anything you are called to do. Hear your people say amen. Hear your people, people say amen to you. Let your kingdom come on earth. Let it be just like we pray to you. Yes and amen to everything that's in your heart. Yes and amen to everything that you have planned. We live to see your will be done and see your perfect kingdom come on the earth. On the earth. Yes and amen, we're taking up our cross for you. Give us the strength to take our dreams and follow through. We live to see your will be done and see your perfect kingdom come on the earth.
on the earth. Yes, all the promises are yes. All the promises are yes. All the promises are yes in you. Every good and perfect gift, every blessing that we have is you. It's a great song, that, you know. And, and that's the attitude that I want. That mode change, that kind of dynamic in the spirit, that concrete day thing. And Nicodemus could have allowed his past, all his learning, all his scholarship, all the depth of knowledge, all his gifts, all his skills, he could have allowed all of that stuff to determine his future. But he chose to move from incognito mode. He went into change mode and was now living in comprende mode. He allowed Jesus to upset the mode. C.S. Lewis says, there are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. And, you know, friends, in church here, we're about to leave a few things behind on, on this journey together. We're about to think of doing things in a different way, and it's a new age, it's a new generation. We're trying and pioneering a lot of new things, you know, and um, there's a lot of fear and trepidation, there's a lot of really work. But I want to tell you that because we're moving, yeah? Because we're changing mode, because it's done with a heart, the loss of this town. I want to tell you that God, that God is well pleased with us. So that's all I've got to say this morning. Uh, we're going to finish a bit early this morning. We'll finish before kids' church, haven't we? So um, I hope that's been a blessing.